Welcome everyone to another episode of Slasher Scotty. I am your host Scotty McCoy and boy do I have a surprise for you. I have, well, uh, let me let the uh, video package to, uh, show you, or shall I say tell you, who my guest is going to be. And after the package is over, I will let you know who my guest is here on Zoom video chat for this interview. Stay tuned, everyone. Enjoy. That's right, everyone. My guest right now is Grant Kirkhope, and he is the musical composer of Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie for the Nintendo 64, as well as World of Warcraft Shadowlands. Um, so how are you doing, Grant? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm really excited to have you on the show. Um, like I told you before I started recording, I've been a huge Banjo-Kazooie fan since I was a, a kid, um, and me and my cousin played it all the time after school, and I still play it to this day. That's awesome. Yes, and also I'm a World of Warcraft fan. Um, I don't have Shadowlands yet, but I've been. Uh, but I just got done playing World of Warcraft about maybe ten minutes ago. <laughs> right. <laughs> That's so exciting to have you on the show. So I have about nine questions, and the first one is: uh, How did you become part of the Banjo Kazooie team? Um. So when I first started at Rare, I was doing. Uh, I did Goldeneye first of all. Okay. And uh, I did a kind of Game Boy conversion at first, but my first real game music-wise was Goldeneye. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, one day, um, one night actually, it was about eight o'clock at night, I was sat, sat in my little room and Chris Stamp, who's one of the bosses of the company, was Tim and Chris Stamp, who ran the company. He turned up with uh, several Japanese guys. I didn't know who they were. I'd already been there, already been there a short time, uh, maybe a, a month or so, two months. Right. And he sort of marked them out and said, Grant, can we just listen to your music for Goldeneye? I was like, oh my God, you know, I'm in trouble or something <laughs> like that. And so I played it, and then they went, yes, yeah, great, and they all went off. I, I think, I don't know, who, I still don't know who it was. I think, I think it was some of the senior Nintendo guys. I don't know who they were. Some of them <laughs> was Mr. Arakawa, but I'm not sure. Um, and then about a short time after that, in the daytime, uh, Tim Stamp, who was the other boss, the brothers, mm -hmm. turned up at, at, with, a, with a young guy who didn't know who he was. I've not been there very long, so I didn't know who he was. And I remember... Um, um, Tim sat on the floor and this young guy sat in the chair and I was like, oh my God, the boss is sitting on the floor. This must be super important. This young guy, maybe some kind of reporter or something like that. <laughs> very kind of, um, the very straight face. So yeah, can we hear your music, please? The golden, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is it. I'm getting fired, you know? <laughs> <clears throat> and um, so I played to the music and um, she just, we like that. Yes, yes, yes. Very good. Yes. I'm just like, you know, not very much emotion. So yes, so we like to come and work on our game and they were working on Dream at the time. 
Mm-hmm. And Dream was a kind of big, a big thing in the company. It was the next, it was a Donkey Kong team who did Donkey Kong Country went on to do Dream. Right. Um, so it was like, a, you know, it was all secret, but it was big news, you know. Right. So uh, I went, oh, oh, right. Uh, fine. Yeah, I'll just finish Goldeneye. No, no, no. Fin- mm-hmm. Goldeneye finished your own dream from today, right now. Move, move your stuff into the into the, the dream barn. I was like, oh my God, that was it, you know. Awesome. So, um, and that eventually turned into Banjo Kazooie. So that's how it's, that's how I got the, I started off. Originally, it was me and Dave Wise together working on Dream. And then Diddy Kong Racing got going and Dave went to do Diddy Kong Racing and I got left to do Dream and then it became Banjo Kazooie. So Banjo Kazooie was, was, was the first game I did all by myself, all the music, all the sound effects. That's awesome. And I'm not going to lie, I every time I hear the music to Banjo-Kazooie and even Banjo-Tooie, I, ha- I get the urge to play it. Like, I don't know how many times I beat the game. I lost count at like probably 100. <laughs> and it's, def- it's definitely way more than that. I've been playing it, like I said, since 98. And I beat it every- both of them multiple times. And the, the songs are just amazing. Like I'll-, like, I'll show you my ringtone right now. And uh, this is my ringtone. Um, I had this, I don't know how, I think since I got this phone, I got the iPhone uh, back last February and I bought this ringtone. Let me get it up quick. I have to, I was, I forgot to get this situated to show you this, but uh, let me see. Ooh. Taking a lot quarter amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but I I have uh, this uh, here it is uh, I'm still getting used to the iPhone too right uh, here it is <laughs> so I have the Gruntilda theme the Gruntilda's Lair theme song this is my second one the first one I got when I first got the game was Gobi's Valley all right all right yeah. So that's this is my ringtone uh, for uh, for my phone. I had it like that for a long time, and I absolutely that's I love either that one or Click Clockwood is my favorite. Right. <laughs> um, so the next question I have for you is: uh, so when Banjo Kazooie is beaten, you obviously hear about Banjo Tooie. Now, did you know that there was going to be a sequel to the game, and were there any plans to release the sequel during the creation of Banjo Kazooie? Yeah, but we knew we were going to do a second game. Uh, I think it was. Just, you know, I think towards the end of the game, we knew we were going to do one, um, so that's why it's in there. So we'd already planned it. Um, so yeah, yeah, it was it was due to go. Awesome. And uh, I guess to go off of that question, have it down further. But uh, so at the end of Banjo Tooie, they also make mention of I guess Banjo Three IE or Three. Um, three. three. Yeah, so over obviously over the years we had Banjo because it was Granny's Revenge and of course Nuts and Bolts, but we never got the Banjo 3 for the Nintendo 64. Were there any talks of creating one and why wasn't it released? No, just when we finished Banjo 2, we were straight underground by the Ghoulies. That was the Banjo team. So, yeah. and you know, that's about that time where I guess. Uh, well, not about the time, but then Microsoft bought the company, so the first game for the Xbox was going to be grabbed by the Ghoulies. We ha- we we we're working on that on the GameCube, but when we got bought, we switched to, to X- Xbox Xbox One, mm-hmm. the X- Xbox the f- first one. Um, so it was never mentioned really. That was it. We were done with it. Um, okay. I feel like Greg, Tim Stamper and Greg Mails. You know, Greg Mails is a lead designer on on uh, those right. games. Greg's very like he's 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 keen to do to do sequels as long as there's something new about it. Right. He, doesn't, he doesn't want to just rehash stuff. And Tim Stampo is very like that too. Very like that too, pardon me. Um, they always wanted to move on. <clears throat> and if there's a, a something new to, to, to be added or something extra, they'll do a sequel. But they didn't want to just do another game just, just again with the same stuff, you know. Right. And so that's why Banjo 3 never got made. Right. And the good thing about Banjo 2 is that like Banjo Kazooie was obviously a very easy game whereas banjo Tui really upped the ante like that was a lot harder than the original which yeah. was actually really cool yeah i feel i think i feel the one mistake on banjo Tui was we just thought making the game twice the size make it made it twice as good and that wasn't that didn't really that wasn't true that right. wasn't, i mean there are a lot of you know so i feel like that's my only comment i think about, i like i think banjo Tui is a great game but even mm-hmm. i would get lost in it like yeah. when you got to land and things like that I'd, yeah get lost and forget where I've been and not work, you know, so it's it's that kind of size of a game. Yeah. So um, musically, I, you know, I felt like I did a, a, a good job of Banjo too. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely did. Hard. So, um, yeah, so yeah, no, I think they're both great games. 
Yeah, and I know with Banjo Tui, I I obviously I beat it multiple times now, so I know everything about it. But in order to beat it the first couple of times, I actually had to use cheats on game backs and all the sites because it is a very difficult game. Now with Banjo Kazooie, I was able to beat that obviously without having to cheat. Um, mm-hmm. But I I'm so addicted to them, like they are such a childhood stand, you know, favorite of mine, and I I love them so much. I mean, you know, it's super touching to me that to this day people still love those games like you right. know, it's odd years later right i think yeah you, you know you wouldn't think it would last that long and i still <laughs> think I, mean, I certainly wouldn't think i'd be asked talk about the music 20 odd year, years later i thought it would last yeah. six months you know like you do and then it's gone you know? right exactly. so it's very humbling to for people to still enjoy remember it mm-hmm. so fun it's, you know it's very nice right and i'm in a bunch of facebook groups that are just dedicated to banjo kazooie like and banjo <laughs> too like it's really cool and like people draw their artwork and share their artwork and everything like it's really really cool um and i guess another question i actually don't have on my list um and i've always been waiting for this for so long will there be in your opinion do you think there will be a banjo kazooie film film Yes, I doubt it. I don't know. I mean, I'll say I've got, I have no insight into Rare at all, I and mean, I still have friends right. that work, uh, you know. But um, I don't have no. I, I, they're doing. They're, they're too busy doing all the stuff that they're doing, like Steve Thieves and that new Idol. I've got the name. I get this name wrong every time. Idol, yeah. not Wild. So I forget it anyway. <laughs> but, um, but um, you know, it would I guess it would need a film studio right. to come up with an idea and present it to Microsoft and then say, can we do it? I mean, like, you know, there is going to be a Rabbids movie. There right. is going to be a Mario movie. It's not like it, it's not like it, it can't happen. Right. Um, and the World of Warcraft movie. Even. Yeah, sure. It would just take yeah. somebody to say, have an idea to do one and present it to Rare. And then, because right. I guess the financing would all become from the movie, the movie studio, the, the movie studio would make all, would do all the financing, right? all the money, we'd they'd do all that stuff. Right. Rare would kind of oversee, I guess, design elements and things like that. So, right. Um, it's you know it's completely possible, but I just think it's unlikely. Yeah, I guess I better get started. I have my company, Gravestone Films. I guess I better start writing a script. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, if you get a great script and present it, you know, that's, that's yep. how it starts, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, never say never. I mean, like, look at they had the Warcraft movie, like they have the Super Mario Bros. They have the Sonic. So, like, you know, hey, you never know. And I think that would be a dream come true for me. Me and my cousin always talk about like we need a movie. <laughs> um so the next question i got for you um so when banjo tui was official how did you get brought back to do the music for the sequel so that again i've just lost track when banjo tui when it was uh like actually made like they decide at the end of banjo kazooie that we're gonna do do a, a second one like how did they bring you back did they were you contracted already or did they just like did you ah, right. yeah sorry yeah yeah sorry so i worked at rare as a staff composer for yeah. 12 years so i was actually in i was in on the i was an employee like everybody else okay so Rare actually had like 10 people i think doing music at the time at the height of it at the, oh, nice. so i was and, I'll, and, and usually composers were like spent most time with one team so the band of Gazoo team i spent most time with them okay. so I was, I was in the block with them they, they, they were called barnes back at rare in those days and so i was um actually on the team so you know we just that right. was, I was just sat there so i just went on to the next one and then grabbed by the goodies and then view pinata and all the rest of it you know so. nice awesome so um which song from banjo kazooie and banjo tui uh do you like the best and which one do you don't uh do you think it, you don't like the like the best like which one do you like the least that's a hard question though. i've got that a lot i just it's hard to, i guess i pick different ones at different times I, mean, I really like freeze easy peak i think it's a great jolly christmas yeah. tune so i do like that a lot I think I like Mad Master Mountain as well. Um, I like that one. I think Banjo Tui. Um, I always like Atlantis. I like Atlantis when you go and, you know, and, and, yes. I, I, like, I think that really suits That's that one. one. Um, but honestly, there's nothing that I don't like, honestly. I think I've been very lucky right. to work on such good games that it's kind of made me write better music than maybe I would normally, because, you know. Right. <laughs> I think when you get inspired, it makes you write better stuff, right? So, yeah. and I'm not a great polisher, so I never, re- I could never really go back and, and redo it again. I don't think I do a very good job of that. Like I am sort of halfway through re- remixing my own Banjo Kazooie album right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been doing it for about a year and a half now. And it's taken me ages nice. to do it. I'm very slow because I've got other work to do. <laughs> so, um, 
so I am doing that. So I will at some point I will release my versions of you know a few of the tunes from Banjo Kazoo. Okay. Um, that, that, that I've done. I've done different styles, like some metal ones, some right. Game Boy sounding ones, of just piano, mm-hmm. orchestra. I'm trying to make it different. Some a ska one, you know. Right. So uh, I'm trying to make it different like that, you know. So I I do hope to release it at some point, but when I get around to it, I don't know. That's awesome. Uh, and obviously, you follow me on Twitter. So uh, once ever you get that done, uh, send it over to me, and I'll t- definitely take a look at that. That'd be really cool. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, so. Um, how did you go about creating the music for both games? Like, what did you do to make the magic happen? Well, you don't know it's magic at the time, do you? You just do your best, don't you? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, it's, you know, I had no idea what that was. I was just trying to find something that was quirky, that mm-hmm. sort of mimicked, the, that, that fitted the, the characters, right? Right. Um, and I didn't want to do some... We were trying to take on Mario 64. Like, that was our, that was our goal. So... I didn't want to write that kind of poppy jazz that Nintendo do because I'm just not very good at it and they're brilliant at it. So there's no point in me trying to emulate that or try to do right. something like that. I had to find something that was a bit different. So I kind of fell across that kind of umpire tritone thing that I do with a, a lot of the tunes that Banjo's kind of known for. Mm-hmm. And um, I just came across that and like the sound of it. It's kind of Dan Elfin, Beetlejuice sort of quirkiness right. to it, you know. Uh, and I felt like that suited the characters. Yeah. So... That that was it, you know. There's no more thought right. to it than that, really. I think you just you shut your eyes and do your best, right? You know, you never really know until much later if you right. did a good job or not, right? You just got to wait until the music gets out there. And also, back in those days, the internet wasn't as rife as it is now, so you had to wait for the reviews and the magazines to come out a month later or whatever it was, you know. So right. you had no idea if people liked it or not. There was no kind of focus test groups that people have now. It's just us in the studio mm-hmm. playing it. Well, we like it. Let's see if anybody else likes it. It's like that. There's nobody else telling you what to do, right? You know. So right. It, and Nintendo look at it, and that's it. So you cross your fingers up for the best. Right. So uh, in Banjo-Tooie, this was actually not on my list neither. I just thought of this one. But, like, in Banjo-Tooie, when you're starting a boss battle, like, obviously, you know, the regular music is there, and then the boss battle music plays. You created that as well? Everything. Everything? Awesome. Yeah, so, so yes, yeah, so cool. Banjo, Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, I did every all the music and all the sound effects. Everything you okay. hear is about me. Awesome. So even, like, the like the characters talking, you created all that too? Okay. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. So I also saw that you did composition for World of Warcraft Shadowlands, as we mentioned earlier. Um, so uh, what parts of Shadowlands did you compose and how was it done? So um, Derek Duke, who's the kind of the music, head of music at Blizzard now, he's, he's, he's a composer okay. too, but he, he kind of head of music too as well now. He uh, contacted me to say, would you like to, you know, write some music for the Warcraft Shadowlands? I was like, you're mm-hmm. joking. I'd love to do that. You know, mm-hmm. World of Warcraft's got such great music, and you know, it's got a lot of great composers that have done it over the years. You know, and, and you know, Neil cree has been doing it for a long time. He's fantastic. David Arkenstone, Glenn Stafford, who works there, fantastic. And this guy Jeff mm-hmm. Le- Lefkowitz, I think his name is. He's a, a new staff composer there. He's also brilliant. So, you know, I was, I was slightly scared to to get involved in it because just because. I don't want to mess it up because the music's so great in World of Warcraft, right? You know, right. Don't, I don't want to yeah. be the new guy and make a mess of it. <laughs> um, but they were super nice to me. And they just sort of um, assigned me... I got, I got Revendreth, most of most Revendreth, Maldraxxus, uh, San Primus was some stuff that I worked on. Okay. So the Blizzard liked to do it where um, they mainly came to me to get some themes. So I wrote a lot of those, those themes. Mm-hmm. And, and then they would pass them off to their other com- in-house composers who will take my themes and do stuff with them. Um, okay. So it, they like to mix it up that way or give me a theme of somebody else's and that, you know, they do a lot of that. Right. So, um, and it, I think they they really think that having multiple composers is their kind of secret source that makes Blizzard, the, 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 the Warcraft music really stand out. Mm-hmm. And it, they've done it that way for years and it really works. Um, and you kind of think it's not, you know, we're all sat different composers, it might sound different, but it really works together. So, right. you know, that was, a step, you know, I did that most of last year really, I suppose. Um, awesome. And there were, Super, the whole team is super nice. Um, they give you all the information that you need. It's not like mm-hmm. you're asking for things. They give you a big list of stuff like here's some artwork, here's a little bit of video, here, here's right. some descriptions. You see, you really get know what they're trying to get, you know, go for. Mm-hmm. And if you don't quite get, they'll say it's not quite right. Can you, can you change that? Can you change that? You know. So, you know, I think the reason Warcraft, I think, is so consistent is they're really careful about keeping it in the in the in the world of what in, in that world. You know, they're really. Mm-hmm. Consistent. The music wise, and so I guess I did most, most of the, the stuff. My stuff was mostly horde, so you know, Derek would say it's good, but it's not quite horde. Could you take that instrument out, or you know, make make it you know, so be very, they're very involved in that. So they've got a really hands on approach to it, and I really like that. I like strong direction, That's so awesome. um, 
yeah, so it, that was a, you know, super fantastic to do. I really enjoyed it. Awesome. And it's, a, it's really a good thing when you, you have a company that they know what they want and th- they, that way they can give you the direction you want. Like they don't just say, create the, like, you know, create something like this and go and do it. And then you come back and it gets frustrating when it's not exactly what they were envisioning, like being hands-on with it and actually giving you the direction and knowing their vision is, it really makes for a great game. Yeah. Cause I, the yeah, music I, really I, is I, everything. Yeah, I mean, like, I feel like Shadowlands looks like, has had a great review drive. People feel it's one of the best iterations of Warcraft, you know, ever, you know. So right. I, think, and I think it really shows that they just try super hard. They, they mm-hmm. really do. They're really, they're really immersed in that lore, you know, of the whole thing. And they, mm-hmm. they eat, eat, sleep, breathe, you know, they, you know, they really do, you know. So, yeah. and I said, I like Strong Direction. So it's great to get stuff. And, they, and, they, and, you know, the worst kind of guy you can work for is a guy that goes, you know what, I don't know what, I don't want to want you to write, but I'll know it when I hear it. And right. Then, you write it for the next 50 years, you know, like, you know, that's, <laughs> you know I've only had that sort of once. Uh, I just, you know, it, was, it was hard, you know. Right. Um, so it's nice to get people who've, who've got an, at least a, 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 a direction to point you in, you know. Right. And the thing is, like, you, with movies, uh, the same the same thing with video games. It The music is really the key point of making or breaking a film or a video game. And, I, yeah, I really think that. I think, I, I, I sometimes feel in movies these days, music can be very epic and very yeah but it can be very unremarkable so you don't remember it anymore mm-hmm. and i feel like i miss that kind of little melodic hooks that we you'd hear in john williams scores or, or right. sylvester or danny elf and people you know you'd hear in the, in the 90s kind of scores that they did you can hear that you know, like star wars for god's sake you've got all those little light motifs that go right through the movie that right. without it wouldn't be the wouldn't be the movie right so i really right. feel like Sometimes these days you get these gigantic scores which are really impressive and super big and you know really, but there's nothing, I, I can't remember a note of it, and I guess that's just my personal view. I, I, I like to remember, like you know, I think that you look at the Marvel franchise that is a gigantic multi-billion-dollar thing, right? But there's not right. that many of those themes you can remember, apart from perhaps the Avengers, which is right. kind of so, is a, an old world composer, old school composer, Back to the Future. You know, he does to write a good tune, right? So mm-hmm. I remember that. And I'm, yeah. I'm hard pushed to remember any of the other ones, really. Um, uh, it may not matter to anybody else, but it matters to me. Right. And, like, even look at the Halloween franchise, that iconic score. Like, you know, everybody, remember, when they hear that mu- mu- you know that music, they know where it's from. Yeah. I think that little bit of something, that you, of Harry Potter or anything, you know. Yep. I feel like you've only got here. Da, 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 da. You're done, right? You're, yep. You know what you are. You know what you're doing. And you, you know, there it is, right? Or the yep. Halloween. You know, you know, you know, so I like those things. And so right. I miss it when it's not there. But like I say, that's just my, maybe just my personal opinion. Right. I, I completely agree. So like, what was the hardest part about uh, composing the songs for Banjo-Kazooie and Banjo-Tooie? I, you know, it wasn't hard really. It's just, you know, I feel like I'm a very kind of instinctual composer. I'm not particularly intellectual mm-hmm. about it. So I just kind of go with what I think, you know, at the time. Yeah. It's kind of, you know, I mess around with a sample on a keyboard. I'm a terrible pianist, but I mess around with it until I, you know, right. I found that, that kind of tritone, you know, that, you know, that kind right. of thing, you know. So it just kind of it gets you going, right? You look at the level, you get inspired by the level. And I feel like once, once I got myself into that kind of banter personality in my head, uh-huh. you know it all came all right you know so yeah. um and also because you're dealing with a very small memory footprint you've only got a certain amount of sounds you can play with yeah so you're not you're not sat with synthesizers looking through thousands of sounds or you know that kind of thing you've just got what you've got you've got to get on with it you know right exactly so what got you into being a musical composer like uh how did you get your start into doing all of that so i went through school as normal i did i played recorder at four played trumpet at six Okay. I did all the kind of, you know, the, the, it's called Associated Board Exams in the UK. It's grades one mm-hmm. to eight of those, went through, went through normal school, uh, ended up at the Royal Norman College of Music, um, doing a degree in music. But I really only went because it meant I, there was four more years of not getting a job, right? I didn't want to get a job. Right. Uh, I was a self-taught guitar player from about 12 onwards. Uh, so I was a big sort of metal rock fan, you know, like that. So, right. you know, um, and so I had long hair and all the rest, leather jacket, all the rest of it, you know, you know, <laughs> classical music college was a, it was a bit weird. They all thought it was a bit strange. <laughs> I finished that at 22, um, and um, while I was at college, uh, you have to pass the harmony exam it's sometime in the four years that I was there. Mm-hmm. And I failed that exam three years out of four because I was terrible at harmony. I really, I just okay. didn't understand it. I was awful at it. You know, I never once ever thought about <laughs> being a composer. It was, you know, didn't even enter my head. 
Right. Yeah, I wrote songs in the metal bands that I played for, but that's about it, you know. Mm -hmm. So when I left college, I went on to play in band. I, I went straight playing in bands after that. I played in rock bands, some bands on trumpet, it's all over the place for about 11 years, really. Oh, wow. Um, and I was on and off on unemployment insurance, you know, uh, for over that 11 years, living at home with my mother. So, you know, got to 33, <laughs> still at home with my mother, um, which is not great, you know. Uh, and just thought I'm just going to be in bands forever. That's what I'm, I'm going to make some money one day, make none the next. It's going to be just you know pretty crappy a bit. That's what, playing in pubs, you name it. You know. Right. Um, so I had a friend of mine called Robin Beanland, who was uh, also playing local bands in the area that I was in. So we, we, we knew each other, and he was a keyboard player. And so like, one day he announced he'd got a job. I was like, you got a job? Like no one I knew got a job, right? Everyone I knew played in bands, and that's how he did it. Um, he said, yeah, I'm going to go work at this company called Rare, writing music for video games. I was like, what? That's the job? You know, didn't, you know, you know, I played a lot of games at the time. I never thought about it. <laughs> Uh, so off he went, and he'd been there about a year and a half. He said to me, you know, Grant, you've been on, off, on and off unemployment benefit for like 11 years. Don't you think mm -hmm. it's time you got a job? And I was like, well, you know, what can I do? He said, why don't you try to do what I'm doing? Why don't you try to do video game music? I was like, I don't know how to do that. He said, well, you know, mm -hmm. I play a lot of games, so I knew how it sounded. So he recommended that I bought a copy of Cubase, an Atari ST computer. I got a synthesizer module called a Proteus FX module. And I sat at home writing music that I thought was appropriate for video games, just at home. Nice. They didn't have to work it. And I sent uh, five cassette tapes to Rare over the course of 1994. Uh, never got a reply. And out the blue, got a letter saying, please come for an interview. I couldn't believe it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I drove down to Rare. It's probably 100 miles from my house, I think, something like that. And Dave Wise actually interviewed me with uh, Simon Farmer, who's the manager of the company at the time. Yeah. And uh, that was on a Friday. And the Monday got a letter saying he got the job. Couldn't believe nice. it. So That's off cool. I went, packed my stuff like my mother and went off to, went to live down in Twycross, when a place called Colville near Twycross, nice. uh, and uh, started working at Rare. I mean, you know, if Robin had never gone and done the job, I'd never have ever done it. It was, you know, I was so bad at harmony. I never could, I could never think, <laughs> being a composer was never in my head. So right. I really, I think even to this day, I kind of don't really understand how I do it. So I really wasn't very good <laughs> at that stuff at all. It seems bizarre that he ended up doing it really. And like I say, it wasn't for him. I'd never done it. So right. Robin's, you know, uh, very, we're still good friends, of course, to this day. It wasn't for him. I'd never do it. So I'm very grateful to him. That's awesome. That's really, really cool. Um, so the last question I got for you, um, do you have any other projects that, you would, uh, that you're working on or composing that you would like to promote or any websites, social media sites or anything else to promote to, anybody, to our viewers and listeners? Well, as usually, you know, we can't talk about what we're working on because of NDAs. Right. And, you know, we never can. So I've got a couple of projects on the go at the moment, uh, okay. which I'm quite excited about. Um, but um, I did a little animation, um, a short animation called The Wrong Rock uh, last year, a year, a year no, two years ago. Okay. And that's just been nominated for a Hollywood Music and Media Award. But it's also on the Oscars shortlist for the <laughs> Oscar short animation, which is amazing. I can't believe it. Uh, how, how far we'll get, I don't know. Because they, they, they do a big list at the start, right? It's like 96 movies, little short right. movies. And then they gradually knock it down to the, to the nominees. Okay. So we're on the big list right now for the yeah. Oscar the short film animation. Awesome. That's cool. So uh, that, that's on YouTube. That it's called the Wrong Rock. It's a kind of a, it's a it's a super feel good movie. So if you, got, I guarantee anybody, if you go and watch it, you'll finish watching it with a smile on your face. It's only about like fourteen minutes long, <laughs> but it's very high quality. It's actually the director is a guy called Michael Kaywood, and Michael Kaywood was also at Rare when I was there back okay. in the day. We didn't really know each other then because we were in different games, and we kind of been for, he moved to LA later, which is bizarre. But I moved to him and kind of went, oh, you're here, I'm here, like that. <laughs> and got, got to be friends again. Awesome. Uh, so uh, he works on on big blockbusters like you know, uh, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, not not Pirates of the Caribbean, like uh, Planet of the Apes, uh, Bumblebee. Oh, okay. uh, he does a big you know AAA blockbusters, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so um, and does his own stuff at the same time. So got to do that. That was great fun. Awesome. Um, so um, I guess that's all I can think about. Really, I can't talk about anything else. <laughs> um, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm, you like on, I'm, yeah, I'm on Twitter at Grant Kirk. I'm on Instagram. I think Grant Kirk went composer. You know, I'm, okay. I'm all the places you're supposed to be. Awesome. Uh, so and you have an IMDb page, right? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, awesome. So if anybody wants to find out what Grant is up to in the future after this interview airs, you can just uh, go on to his uh, IMDb page. I'm sure that'll be updated. Grant Kirk Hope on IMDb. Right, yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me, Grant. Anytime. Awesome. It's been an honor. Yeah, I've talking right. to you. Thank you. Have all a right. good rest of your day. You too. All right, bye. Bye.